welcome to my uh, concept called the Real-Time Autonomous Shark Monitoring System. And uh, let's begin. So, my approach is that we actually really need to do something. And because when people are attacked, it really is a shocking event that will never be forgotten by those close to the victim. Um, I'm sure some of you may have heard the silly old argument that we should do nothing about the problem of shark attacks, that the, shark is, that the ocean is the shark's territory. And yes, sharks do live in the ocean, and humans on the land. However, as Western Australians, some of us basically live in the water during summer. And in those waters off our coast, both humans and sharks are occasionally in the same space at the same time. We are not invaders of the shark's territory. We are just another animal living on this planet, experiencing the Earth's astonishing natural environments. Yet as humans, we do have the ability to understand beyond our familiar habitat. We have this inherent drive to be connected with nature and to immerse ourselves, our bodies and our minds in all of nature's environments. To not only experience the geology of its environments, but the biology too. We can enter safely or not, for necessity of our survival and evolution, for curiosity or for leisure, into more regions of the earth than any other animal. And in doing so, we have developed the capacity to comprehend the behaviour of many of this planet's animals. To even reorganise our environment build human habitats in places where humans could never naturally live, and to develop technologies and extension of the human mind. If we are capable of these complex understandings and of such magnificent technical abilities, why do we not intelligently deploy useful technologies to warn us and to protect us from, the, from one of the inherent dangers in the waters off our coasts, by simply monitoring the movements of sharks? We have spent decades building a panopticon a global communications and information technology complex that has been used to monitor us, capable of tracking out every digital interaction, triangulating our position to within a few metres using our cell phones, recording our purchase history, listening to our private calls, monitoring our private emails, we have Google Earth, Google Street View, even our biometrics are stored. Yet, we cannot track a mere shark, a creature which morphologically and behaviourally has practically been unchanged in millions of years. Why are we, in the 21st century, with all of the modern technology available to us, still chaotically killing wild animals and leaving ourselves open for them to kill us? Whilst we must respect nature, we must also respect human ability. Humans should not be at the mercy of our environment or the creatures in it if we have the ability to protect ourselves. Why let nature dictate when, whether we should die or not? I say that we move beyond the false dichotomy of sharks or humans presented to us at the media and by the pro and anti cult groups, and my focus is on what humans have the ability to do. You know, while most of us do not possess the incredible ability to safely interact with sharks after spending years developing an acute understanding of their signals and behaviour, those who feel safe swimming with sharks do so in a very select conditions. They are expecting to be in the water with sharks and they have a purpose when they are in the water with them. I can assure you that even people who free dive with sharks would not want to be sitting on a surfboard at the surface of the water, unaware of the great white shark below them. Most of us would prefer to avoid an unexpected human shark encounter, and if we were aware that there is a large or dangerous shark in the water, we would want to get out of the water safely, giving way to the shark as it passes through. I mean, it's no big deal if there's sharks in the water, but if we know they're there, why not get out? That's common sense says. So in the 21st century, we should be aware of the presence of dangerous sharks in the waters where humans are playing, so that we can enjoy this immersive time. We can learn from it, but also come home safely. So, to this problem, there is a possible solution, and my concept may, in fact, be a solution to the problems that occur when humans and sharks are in the water at the same time. It could be called the Autonomous Real-Time Shark Monitoring System. At this stage, it's just a concept. Most of the technology I'm going to uh, mention is already proven, but I'll go over the challenges this system faces and why it needs to be assessed by experts in order to determine its feasibility. Now, this uh, solution is achieved through the application of modern unmanned uh, autonomous vehicles or UAV technology, better known as drones in the pop culture. So through the use of aerial and marine drones, an area, for example, stretching from Trick Point to Cotazoi Groin, from the shoreline to a kilometre or so out, uh, to in sea, uh, is monitored in real time using specialised airborne and underwater sensors. Uh, wireless communication technologies, a central control station, digital imaging processing, 
an autonomous alert system and a public warning system and viewing network come together to provide an integrated system that serves the public, protects human life, benefits the scientific method, conserves marine life and allows humans to connect with our environment and the denizens of the deep. So here we have uh, an example of the monitored zone. Uh, on, the, on the left there you can see a bit of a uh, diagram. Uh, basically what you have is the drones represented by the uh, red dots and then the vision range is represented by the, the uh, dotted circles. So the idea is that the vision range overlaps and then the entire red zone would be uh, covered. Um, essentially, you could also have these little marine surface drones, which are represented by the little blue squares, and they would be on patrol, collecting scientific data, and also giving an underwater view of sharks if you actually come across them. So here's an example of a drone recently being used to uh, have a look at a pod of dolphins, and you can really see how this technology is excellent for getting a lot of the shot of marine life. So that's just with a little hobby drone, which is the Phantom DJI. They've got a GoPro mounted to them. They cost about 1500 bucks. So that's what you can do for $1,500. Obviously, the flight time is only about 20 minutes, but proves that you can see uh, ocean life from a drone, obviously. So the aerial drones basically have uh, these specialised cameras that are mounted to them. They must be purpose-built from the ground up for long-duration hovering and for operation in the high wind speeds and saline conditions of our coast. Uh, pretty tough conditions out there. So these drones will be programmed to hover in a grid above the ocean at a fixed location. Obviously the higher the drone hovers, the larger the area we can image. However, the higher the drone, the more complex the onboard camera must be. So at greater heights, the camera must have a greater resolving power, and therefore you need a heavier and more costly camera. If the drone hovers at a lower height, we can image a smaller area, requiring a less complex and inexpensive onboard camera. However, you know, with lower drone hovering heights, you need more drones to cover the same area, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Obviously, the vision range of, that of, of the adjacent drones overlaps, providing complete area coverage. These drones are, as, as mentioned, equipped with specialised cameras and polarised lenses. So they can reveal to us what the naked human eye cannot. Uh, with these systems, we can image deeper than the human eye, and we can remove the uh, glare effects. That, that would be on the surface, uh, just like if you look out the window, it's pretty glary right now. Um, such a system could detect sharks, whales, other marine life. Um, as you've seen in the next slide, these cameras are quite heavy and would be very expensive. However, keep in mind, these cameras are only going to get smaller, more advanced and cheaper. Um, ideally, uh, you know, we would program these drones to hover all day and return to a central uh, charging station and servicing station at night. However, with current technology, uh, battery, with current battery technology, flight time is very short. Of course, there is a question of long life and high output power source, and that needs to be investigated. Uh, but there's also the alternative of using uh, fuel power drones. So fuel has a significantly higher concentration of energy per mass. So basically, if you have a fuel power drone, you don't have to, it's, it, it's, it's much lighter. Of course, the uh, nitro engines weigh more than electric motors, but for now, fuel power drones are still capable of longer flight times than battery power drones. Um, of course, a fuel power drone consumes significantly less fuel than a full-scale helicopter, so keep that in mind. Um, the beauty of this system is that it's not, it's not permanent. It does not interfere with the environment or marine life. It's mobile, it's interchangeable, it's upgradable, and has multiple uses, such as search and rescue. And recently, the drone was actually used for that, somewhere in, in one of Australia, I can't remember. But it has been used before. So here's a... Here's a, here's a um, something that we do a lot, we do biomimicry, so we look at how animals solve problems and we then make technology to mimic that. And this is a pretty good uh, example of that and some specialised cameras in action. When it comes to vision, most birds have much more sophisticated eyes than ours. Their colour vision is more sensitive. They can differentiate more colours than us, and this is a big advantage to some sorts of birds. The kingfisher. Kingfishers hunt fish, but this presents a problem. They have to see through the surface of the water to spot their prey. The greatest problem is the surface itself. It reflects light. 
making it hard to see the fish below. But Kingfisher vision overcomes this problem. Like many birds that hunt fish or spend time over water, their eyes contain filters that reduce the amount of blue light they see. It's not clear exactly how this works, but it could help them see through the surface reflections to target their prey. This ability to filter out different colors has been developed for human use. Engineers have designed a special camera that can be mounted on an aircraft. This is really multiple cameras, all seeing different colors, and the operator can choose to add or subtract whichever colors he needs to enhance the image. To human eyes peering down on the ocean from an aircraft, the surface of the sea looks completely opaque. But by manipulating the different wavelengths that form the image, it's possible to cut through the surface glare and see down into the ocean itself. Dustin Medeiros interprets the images. What you'll see a little bit of is as we're flying over the water, you'll see a little bit of splashes on this, but this is mostly video. Right now we're in the middle of a uh, turn. We're going to come around for another pass. This camera system has a very valuable use in conservation. Many whales are threatened by extinction, and vital to any management plan is to know how many there are and where they are. We used to try to count them from aircraft, but unless they were very close to the surface, they couldn't be counted accurately. But with this system, seeing below the surface reveals how many whales there are. So from here, we can clearly see one. Uh, the second one is very easy to uh, see. The other one is mostly diving at the moment. So what I can, that's from the visual angle. So what we can see from the images coming down is all three whales are clearly standing out against the background. So we can confirm now that there is actually three whales there and that they're traveling. And actually, I can hold on them and follow them and track them as they move. We can see the whales and we can see what they're doing. The camera may be even more sophisticated than the Kingfisher. The computer doesn't just filter out the blue from the surface, it can filter out different blues or greens. If you use the blue and the green, one sees down into the depths of the water and one reflects off the surface of the water. Manipulating the colors that the camera can see allows us to see into different depths, several meters below the surface. This camera has huge potential. So that's pretty important as well because as the conditions of the day change, we need to calibrate the uh, camera so that it can continue to see below. So, you know, obviously in the morning, you set differently to when you are there when it's windy and glary. So now we're going to look at the detectability of the system like this versus what we currently do. Um, you know, this is actually summarised from a study by, led by Dr. Will Robbins, who I've spoken to, and he's also interested in these types of systems. Um, in the first case on the left, we have a human with binocular vision scanning the water at an angle from a fast-moving aircraft. So the recent study summarised that flying an aircraft along a flight path of high speeds over a patrolled area means that any point along that flight path is only really covered for just a few minutes each day. So when you're at the beach at and you see the thing go past, that little spot of water that you're at has only been patrolled for just a few minutes. Um, so this study that uh, Dr. Will Robbins led used dummy sharks to show uh, overall detection rates of human observers 
to be only 12.5 and 17.1 percent for fixed wing or for helicopter observers. Uh, the targets uh, that were placed in the water were at depths of only 2.6 metres and within 500 metres of the flight path. So helicopter observers have consistently higher detection rates than the fixed wing craft, but neither the aircrafts uh, sighted more than 9 percent of the dummy sharks uh, deployed over 300 metres away from the flight path. So sharks are effectively undetectable for more than 300 metres from, from the other side of the flight path. Um, obviously movement of the shark in the controlled area also alters the possibility of being detected. The shark can just swim in as the, as the plane goes by. So in summary, the controlled area can never be properly covered and such costly patrols only can never, can never provide full-time, full-area coverage, which even though they make us feel safe, when we see the chopper fly by, the effectiveness of these patrols is really low. In the second case on the right, we have a drone where the camera is mounted and points directly down into the water. So already you're getting rid of that problem that you get when you look at the water from an angle. And as mentioned, the drones will hover in a fixed location. They completely cover that region because of the overlapping vision. So movement of sharks in the patrol area does not alter the possibility of being detected. Sharks can move, but they're always going to be spotted. Um, the specialised cameras allow for superior distance and depth of detection and they eliminate human error. So basically if a shark is within the detectability parameters of the autonomous system, the detection rate is 100%. There's no human error. The real-time autonomous shark monitoring system can provide full-time, full area and real-time coverage of the monitored zone. Um, and just to kind of bring things in perspective for everyone, uh, recently I was sent this photo by a photographer who purchased a DJI Phantom with a mounted GoPro, you know, about 1500 bucks. And this shot was taken at about 60 metres over Coogee Beach where the Eco Shark Barrier was installed. Um, out of all the current solutions, I think the Eco Barriers are the best, but the ocean pools they have over east, and we definitely love them here. But, you know, they, they only provide uh, guaranteed safety for a very small area. So, how it, so covering huge areas of the West Australian coastline would require a lot of material and a lot of maintenance. So this photo kind of demonstrates the point that I'm constantly making about the system. It's that compact, integrated, high-tech solutions like this are always cheaper than machine-intensive solutions such as helicopters and boats. They're always going to be cheaper than energy-intensive solutions such as, once again, helicopters, boats, crews, maintenance, all that stuff, and they're also significantly cheaper than material-intensive solutions, which would require kilometres of netting or fencing. So here we have one drone that could cover the entire area that these barriers cover. Um, and this is an example of ephemeralisation, which is a term coined by Buckminster Fuller. He said that it's the ability of technical advancement to do more and more with less and less until eventually you can do everything with nothing. So Fuller's vision was that ephemeralisation will result in ever-increasing living standards and an ever-growing population despite seemingly finite resources. So with our human ingenuity and technology, we can always do more and more and more. And in the, in the long run, solutions like this are going to be cheap because, as we know, cell phones are small now compared to what they were 10 years ago. Same thing for the cameras, same thing for all the onboard communication systems, and same thing with battery technology. So the second instrument that we use is a uh, marine drone which floats on the surface and these are solar and wave powered. There's no issues with these. These are already production level. Uh, they're produced by Liquid Robotics, which is a California company. These drones actually hold the longest journey by an autonomous vessel. Uh, I think they went across the Pacific. They will be programmed to patrol the, the zone. Basically, they can be equipped with salinity sensors, with oxygenation sensors, with temperature sensors, underwater cameras, and acoustic transponders. So all the while, whilst they're out there, we're also collecting all this information. You know, sharks are coming in. Why are they coming in? Is it because there's low salinity, high salinity? Is it because there's high levels of oxygen? Some people think that um, in, in the summer, sharks, and this happens in South Africa, will come in, um, maybe talking about drones now, they'll come in to the uh, coastal areas because the waters are richer in oxygen. And this means they don't need to swim this intensely because sharks must swim, or most, almost all sharks must swim in order to get oxygen into their gills. So when there's high levels of oxygen in, in the shallow areas of the coast, they come in there. 
Um, you know, of course, these uh, underwater cameras will also allow us to identify individual sharks, like their species, their sex, and their scars, what their size is. Um, yeah, basically, very, very good uh, complement to what we already do because these these um, drones can also have acoustic transponders mounted to them, and that increases the effectiveness of the already existing shark monitoring network. Which, is, which uses acoustic technology, so the sharks are then tagged and they have trackers placed on them. They swim past the acoustic boys. If they don't swim within 300 metres of them, they won't be picked up. If they don't have a tag on them, we're not going to pick them up at all. So with this, we can spot more sharks and we can also tag more sharks and then we can also pick them up again using these types of drones. So basically, what brings this together is a central processing and viewing station. So images and measurements sent in real time from the autonomous drones with, you know, using wireless technology uh, to a central processing station. So the central station will house the communication and navigation control systems. There will be an array of monitors that display the live images and measurements generated by the equipment installed on the aerial and marine drones. I mean, a place like this could house uh, control stations. It doesn't, it's not, not a very big uh, footprint. So, on the computers that are uh, getting the live images coming in, there will be edge detection and shape recognition algorithms. And they'll be applied in real time to the images like, as they come in. So this is a very cheap in fact. You can basically just buy components from a computer hardware store and build a system like this. Um, image processing will make it very hard for a shark to enter the monitor zone and stay undetected for any significant duration. Um, when the shark is detected, an alert system will warn human operators of potential shark activity, which they will then investigate to confirm if the alert is actually due to a shark. Uh, the central station will integrate with the current shark monitoring network, surf life saving club networks, warning stations, a free website, and that will allow you know, kids and the public to view the live feeds. You can even have the TVs and stuff down at the beach. So this is obviously a snapshot from the video we just watched, um, where specialised cameras were mounted onto the helicopter in order to count the whale populations. Uh, the point is, is that the specialised cameras allow for increased distance and depth of detection when compared to a human observer, and even more importantly, will allow for the improved use of edge detection algorithms in comparison to like a normal image coming from a normal camera. Obviously because the normal image does not exhibit high contrast uh, and strong edges, but also exhibit the surface glare. So, you want to run the algorithm on the specialised, uh, on the image that the specialised cameras produce. So here's an example of a pretty famous shot recently taken by a large great white shark. I've just applied that algorithm. You can see the edge very easily. Obviously that shape that the computer picks up will then be compared to a shark shape and also to see if it's um, exhibiting uh, like shark movement. Um, basically, you know, all sharks are going to move like this, so if the, if the image is making that pattern, then it's a shark. So humans will then be alert to take a look. So once again, you know, Perth sand beaches are, are ideal for this type of stuff. Um, this example shows another, uh, this, this image is another example of edge detection that has been applied to an aerial image of a shark found on Google. It's just a normal image, not, it's not high res, it's just, I just Google shark from a helicopter, pull this, chucked into the algorithm. So this is just a normal image. Of course, a high resolution image produced by a specialised camera, which removes that surface glare and all the other effects would work even better. So using graphics card technology um, and software technology developed by a company called NVIDIA, which is capable of highly parallelised computing and processing, the images streaming in from all of the drones can be processed in parallel and in real time. So um, on one, I've done the test on one consumer level uh, desktop PC. Um, I've reduced this, but I scaled it up to, to a hypothetical scenario where I have two or three of these uh, graphics cards installed, and that PC will cost about $5,000 and will provide the required parallel computation power to process between 100 and 1,000 live streams all simultaneously in parallel. So this means that one PC, which costs around $5,000, would be required to process the live stream coming in from 100 plus drones. So one little PC would easily cover from here to corner zones, depending on the spacing and the height. So this is just an example of what those graphics cards are. It's just a simple thing, you know, plug it into your computer and it goes ahead. Uh, here's, a, here's like a kind of like a crude um, 
version of the edge detection stuff done by UWI researcher, uh, Professor Mohammed Benamun. And you can see it picks up every edge. This was actually tiger sharks at Trig when there was 12 tiger sharks at Trig, I can't remember, about 2012. You can see how that's picking it up. This is not image processing like what the graphics card does, but it's a similar, similar method. So what happens once we confirm that there is a shark? So what we could do is we could, some, a human could pilot one of the drones and follow the shark. Um, you know, there is the integration of the specialised camera technology, all the processing, all the superior detectability, all of that stuff, all the autonomous alert systems, but humans would still be required for the, for the decision making process. If every shark that the system detected issued an alert, and since there are so many sharks in our waters, as we require, as we've been made aware of with the recent drumline program putting all the tiger sharks out of the water, then beach, shark, then beach goers would constantly be warned to get out of the water and the warnings would lose significance. So the conditions and the crowds would need to be taken into consideration along with the size and the species of the shark, with you know, large great white sharks and bull sharks posing the most danger. So this system would be integrated with warning stations at the, at the beaches, I mean, the tower up there would be a pretty good, pretty good one. Uh, you know, uh, Basically, the shark is considered to be dangerous and to be coming in within a dangerous proximity to humans that are in the water. Warning signals will be issued and lifeguards would assist in getting people out of the water. So people in the water must get out and give way to the shark as it passes through the system. Basic common sense. So viewing stations can be installed at the beaches for public viewing and the surf life uh, saving watchtowers and this would provide the people with a, a good reason to get out of the water since they'd be able to see the shark in real time. Like, it's all very good for the shark alarm to go off, but if you can't see the shark, then it kind of, you know, you might be motivated to get out of the water. So, something that is not happening when we're catching all these sharks right now, the drumline program, is that we're not doing any real scientific uh, analysis of the sharks. We're not tagging them, we're not, so, there's not even a warning system that lets us know that there is a shark on the line, so they, they, they die. And it's just, a, it's just a waste because these sharks aren't really attacking us. Um, no one's been attacked by a tiger shark in Chief Beach at least. So marine biologists could classify the shark, the, the sex, the species, all that stuff. And of course, once again, you know, they, they do the tag and release program and with the, with the uh, wave gliding drones by Liquid Robotics, it integrates again with the pre-existing shark monitoring network. So we're not, we're not building anything new, we're actually just expanding on what we already have. Um, another, another thing that we could do, because we have constant monitoring of the area, is that we can see when whales or whale carcasses are in the area. And instead of letting it wash up into the beach, we can, we can tie the wave quick stuff. You know, there could be just one tugboat at Hillary's, one, one at Freo, and we can get the location of the whale carcass and tow it out straight away. And of course, once again, marine biologists would get out there and watch the sharks as they interact with the whale carcass and feed on it. You know? It's just going to give us so much heads up about all the activity in the water. Um, there was a big concern about the drumline program when the, when the, when the Rock Nest Channel system was on. This, this system that I propose would actually monitor the, the Rock Nest Channel swim that would allow us to see if there are sharks coming into the area where people are swimming instead of actually being a hazard, which was a lot of, what a lot of people were concerned about. So just another good thing, it's flexible, it's not permanent. It can be programmed to hold it anywhere. So another thing is uh, the type of stuff we got in Coral Bay. Um, you know, currently we use man flights that run daily in order to spot marine life. And they direct the tour boat operators to a better snorkeling and diving experience for the tourists. So drones can instead hover or patrol the marine life hotspots. This allows operators to reduce their costs and reduce their footprint. And making it cheaper for tourists to actually get out there and get in the water with, the, with, whale, with whale sharks. And as Western Australians, we should be able to swim whale sharks without 400 bucks in our pockets. You know, operators will have an increased awareness of the location of marine life, such as the manta rays and whale sharks, but also allow them to avoid dangerous species like tigers and great whites. So there are a few concerns about the system. Um, here's a photo of a tiger shark, <laughs> if you can see it. Um, this, is, this has only been taken a few metres away. And Tiger sharks, when swimming in the open waters, will choose to follow patches of weeds or reef to minimise their visual contrast to predators and prey. Um, but once again, we're in Perth's, in Perth's sandy beach bottoms. It's 
ideal. Uh, it's very hard for a shark to enter far into the monitored zone without being detected. Obviously, it can get in there for a bit, but after a couple of hundred metres or a kilometre, it will be picked up because it's got to come into an area of high contrast. Another concern is the uh, heavy payload of a long duration battery life. Obviously, that's why I seek to publicise this idea in order to attract expert attention for the purpose of validating the feasibility of each technical aspect of the system. People need to look at this, they need to figure out if it is an actual possibility. Until then, I'm going to be sure. If it's shown to be not feasible, well then, it's all good. Um, the outlook I have is obviously purpose built drones, and this in itself pre presents challenges, but also an excellent opportunity for local universities, engineering and fabrication companies. And we could build all the stuff in WA. We may even need to buy the, the communication technology uh, chips and that stuff. It's so what we have here is a high state of organisation complexity. We have the uh, opportunity for concentrated and focused development of science and technology. Basically, the development of this system is multifaceted. The projects could integrate the following fields of science. Computer science, and that would deal with the navigation and programming of drones, drone activity, along with the digital data acquisition, processing and imaging of the live feeds, and scientific data. You've got mechanical and optical engineering, dealing with all the challenges designing the drones, Making, you know, making sure that they're capable of hovering in the high wind speeds that we have, counteracting the problem of uh, increased weight due to more battery cells or figuring out if we're actually going to go down the fuel path or not. So we need to deal with also the uh, manufacturing and the fabrication, the testing of the drones and optical systems and the lenses. I mean, all this stuff can be fa fabricated using you know, CMC uh, machines, uh, you know, computer-aided design. This is all pretty good stuff for uni, uni students. Um, electrical and telecommunications engineering. That's dealing with the design of the electrical and digital components on board the drones, obviously as, as well as the long life battery system and the wireless communications, which is the backbone of the system. And then you have mechatronics, which is uh, you know, dealing with the challenge of integrating the electronic devices, such as the onboard equipment, with the mechanical design of the drones, the information technology, and you know, developing the system as a whole central control station, the charging stations, the warning stations, and the public wing stations. And then, of course, you have the massive benefits of marine science and biology, which deals with the challenge of understanding the abundance of measurements that the system will generate in order to build better models of shark behaviour, shark biology, the oceans, and other marine life, which better approximate reality. We really don't know what's going on right now. Reality is out there, and we need sensors to figure out what is happening. So, you know, uh, if this project was funded, it would provide excellent opportunity for young uh, university researchers, uh, you know, PhD projects, all that stuff. And essentially what we have is an evolved monitoring and shark attack prevention system. So this extrasensorial system directly protects humans by alerting us to the presence of sharks in the water while we are swimming, surfing, diving and playing. This allows us to safely get out of the water and give way to sharks as they pass through. This system really does invalidate perceived need to cull sharks because if we know that they're there, why would we need to cull them? So with this system, we transcend the debates, the protests, and we protect sharks from the ecologically damaging drumline program, which does not, once again, directly protect humans. There is no, there's no mechanism with the drumline program to stop sharks attacking humans, and there is no warning system with the drumline program. Just the other day, there was a great white shark entry point. Drumlines are there. Great white sharks right where everyone's swimming, at Trick Point, where everyone's surfing at Trick Point. Great white sharks are known to migrate from South Africa and live deep into the Southern Ocean, swimming past hundreds of kilometres of long line fishing hooks and make it all the way to Cotton Bay. So, you know, it's, you know, large great white sharks are intelligent and it's speculated that they may not even bite the beta drum lines to begin with. So, this, this program is only targeting really you know, non threatening species like tiger sharks. So, with this system, not only both humans and sharks are protected, Sharks are humans, and humans are sharks. This system provides a high state platform for both public safety and for the study of marine life. Our society is provided with the required architecture in order to conserve and coexist with marine life. You know, it's all well and good to say you want to coexist and you want to conserve, but you need actual physical systems in order to do that. So regardless of the opinion, we, regardless of opinions, we can move away from the false dichotomy of humans or sharks in which we're presented by the, by the media and by the pro and anti code groups. So this publicly funded system would be an addition to WA's infrastructure and would be considered as a public service. The public can access the live feeds, 
activity updates and other information relevant to the system through a free website. The effectiveness of the shark, the pre-existing shark monitoring network has improved significantly. More sharks can be tagged due to an improved awareness of shark activity. The individuals would not be required to buy unproven shark attack mitigation solutions from, co from private companies and from private companies in order to feel safe. Um, this is something that everyone benefits from. So the development of this evolved system would put WA at the global forefront of shark cons conservation in, and in several fields of technology and natural sciences. Since this system requires purpose-built drones, local universities will undertake that challenge of designing and building them. You know, right now we're, we're under the international spotlight for being, you know, anti-conservationists. We're, we're being criticised for killing sharks. Well, why not put us to the forefront for conserving sharks? You know, we don't need to save the sharks. We just need to leave them alone. Just don't interfere with them. And this system will ask for that. Um, obviously, you know, there's benefits to Western Australia and tourism. Obviously, Western Australians will become more aware of the presence of the marine life in their backyard. West Australia will become the darling of wildlife-oriented media. Nature programs will line up to cover the workings of the system and to explore the wildlife that it monitors. Obviously, there's massive implications for ecotourism. Um, the system has become a world-famous feature of WA, and tourists from all over the world could visit WA to see it firsthand. Data collected from the system will be shared with researchers worldwide and will put WA at the forefront of global shark research. And finally, there's something to think about, you know, everyone has got this kind of pop culture idea of drones where on the left you see like, you know, drones which are used for warfare, you've got drones in pop culture movies like The Terminator and Oblivion. It's all about killing and war and that stuff, but we can also use drones to meet human need. On the right hand side we see drones that are used for uh, you know, wildlife conservation, for subsea exploration and all these things. So we can use drones for our for our purposes, to meet our needs. So just because we cannot deploy such a system immediately does not mean we should not investigate it. Right? We could even experiment with remote controlled hybrid fixed wing quadcopter quad quad systems, basically like a normal fixed wing system that is more efficient but also has the ability to hover. They're working on things like this now. And we could at least, you know, we could at least before next summer mount specialised cameras to the current helicopter patrols. We should at least be doing that. This is something that already exists. It's already proved to integrate with helicopters. It should be done. Um, and by doing that, we're going to, you know, develop the uh, autonomous system much better because we're going to meet, we're going to see all the challenges that, challenges that we face and scale it down to the, uh, to the drones. So I, I say, ultimately, if we're going to devote so much attention to this issue, then we need to prevent shark attacks from happening so that we do not continue with these ridiculous levels of irrational paranoia and fear of sharks. That's one side. Others were so caught up in the other side of the frenzy that they even began to anthropomorphize sharks, saying things like sharks need cuddles or sharks are our friends, but this is equally as useless. It doesn't really solve the problem. So that we can enjoy the summers to come and move on from this distraction that consumed public discourse for an entire summer, we must begin to investigate such systems. All that has happened so far with this distraction was that it's used for political agendas which achieve nothing in terms of protecting human life or conserving these wild animals. I mean, clearly the political process has failed to solve the problem of sharks attacking humans and humans chaotically killing them in response. I mean, just the other day, once again, whilst the drum lines were still there, there was a large great white shark just south of Trick Point. You know, the drum lines also did not catch a single great white shark. You know, ultimately, the drum line program failed in Perth, just as it did in Hawaii. So we need actual solutions, and the public and the scientific community must be made aware of these. So let's do what we can do, technically, to solve this problem and move public discords onwards in an attempt to address the real issues and priorities that we face as humans by using technology and the scientific method. Thanks. There was supposed to be a uh, drone coming in from somewhere, but <laughs> just imagine one out there <laughs> with all of the uh, videos that we just saw and you know, the possibilities. Imagine coming down the beach a couple of summers time and seeing the drones hovering out there, coming back, coming back inside to charge up, you know, simple stuff. We could do it. Simple as that.
Have you had any feedback from the government or the surf lifesaving to actually look at taking it further? So, I did issue a brief description of this to Colin Barnett's office. They did get back to me and they said that they would put me in the system for the next round of funding. I mean, doesn't mean that they're going to investigate it. Obviously, they need some sort of presentation of the proposal before they go ahead with something like that. That's kind of what I'm trying to do. But at this stage, you know, there has been no real interest from anyone. The Surf Life Saving Club, um, I think they would be very interested in this if they had access to that. I mean, you imagine the guys down on the beach in their, in their huts, they've just got their little tablet and they can see what's going on. Makes their job easier, uh, but no feedback. How long ago did you tell them? Um, the Surf Life Saving Club's only last week, but the politicians and all those I've known since the first um, shark cull, the anti anti shark cull protest. That was January the 4th, so it's now May, and it was on the TV every day. But <laughs> not much about solutions, that's okay. How far do you think the library can see down into the water, say on an overcast day, for example? Yeah, that needs to be investigated. Um, from what we saw from the uh, whale spotting documentary, those helicopters were pretty high. Uh, I would imagine that they're much higher than what we'd have the drones hovering. Um, and it depends on the, what, what you do with the images. I have no idea yet. If I have access to that, I'd be able to give you a good answer. But it's definitely deeper than what we can see. Yep. Definitely deeper. That's, that's without a doubt. From the helicopters, of course, yeah. So there's supposed to be a drone coming at the end of that. There was supposed to be one, yeah. Um, a fuel powered one and a battery powered one. Okay. Um, I think the guy has, he's getting married, so he's pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, a fair, it's a fair call, it's a fair excuse. Yeah. Definitely. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure one of you guys probably know someone who has one of those drones. They're pretty cheap those days. Yeah, I know that your dad has it. Yeah. So, I mean, this stuff has become popular, it's become cheaper. There's no, there's no reason why we can't at least you know, investigate it. If, if it means that we have to go for fuel, that's okay, because it's still going to use way less fuel than the helicopter. And it's still, going to, it's still going to be able to monitor the area for significantly more time. I mean, even if we only get two hours, it means you've got two hours of full coverage as opposed to a few minutes, costing who knows how much, I mean, what they spent like. Was it, how much like? How many millions have they spent on this, um, the whole kind of like program over the next five years? It's, it's like 20 million or something, isn't it? Yeah, for everything, for the, for the crews, for the helicopters, hey? Yeah, research at UWA, all that. Yeah. They haven't even released how much it costs on the whole colour yet. No. And they won't, they've been asked by a lot of people. Yeah. It's certainly a lot more than they uh, initially suggested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said it was 600000 for the season, for that one guy. For the one guy, yeah. 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 But then, of course, you've got the police, because the heat's getting threatened, so you've got the police on standby, you've got everybody out in the boats using their time and trying to stop it. You know, you've got a lot of wasted effort, a lot of wasted resources, and a lot of dead tiger sharks. I know as a surfer, I'd feel a lot better with the drone sitting up there than a yeah. helicopter that goes past me once every three hours. Mm. Yeah. That's a placebo effect and it's a massive waste of money here. Yeah. It's yeah. a great myth that the government loves to sell that mm -hmm. helicopters keeping you safe. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. As you can see, like that study, that's, I mean, we had a, a researcher from Curtin who did as much as he could to prove that this stuff is ineffective. Yeah. But he said, you know, you want a, a drone sitting above you when you're in a, in a remote location surfing. I agree, absolutely. And like, once again, you know the different types of solutions that you have, you've got the eco barrier, you've got wetsuits, shark shields, all that type of stuff. Yeah, some of them are good for remote applications, but once again, you can just have a single drone over a surf spot. You can have a, you can have a array of drones over a public beach. It's, once they're developed, it doesn't cost much to run. Now we've been in talks with um, the 
community in the southwest about bringing in a, a shark spotters program, yeah. similar they have in South Africa. Yes, yes. And something like the drones would be perfect to tie in with that with the guy on the cliff. Absolutely. It, it's got a lot of application. Though. Yeah, I mean, who could be getting the feed from the guy? The guy's got eyes on the water. Can also be getting the feed from the, from yeah, the drones as well. Yeah, if he has or hasn't seen something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And once again, you know, shark spotting program is great, but you still got that angle. Drones directly over, so. but yeah, that's good feedback. Who's uh, who's uh, uh, who's mostly, uh it's, it's kind of through the No Shark Coal group, but yeah. um, um, mostly with uh, Sharon Burton, the mother of one of the victims, yeah. to set up the community shark readiness program, and it's to do with that. We've had a few meetings with locals in the southwest, and it was quite interesting because the media will portray to you that everyone down there is pro coal, <laughs> and we went down there expecting in this meeting to get you know probably told off a bit, and they were so angry at the government because they'd had no consultation. And one of the guys who was one of the best mates of the last guy who was killed down there, he was absolutely ropeable about the drum lines being in. You know, he felt far less safe with them in. So it was good to get that feedback from them, and they actually wanted people to come to them and give them alternatives. And one of them was the shark spots that they were really keen on, and the idea of drones in conjunction with that is, it's got a lot of you know, potential. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because drum lines catch small sharks and then the big sharks come in. Well, even on the trip here, I've been out in boats, you know, yeah. watching fisheries, and we've seen the tiger sharks, they just gorge their stomachs. Mm -hmm. And we had a slick 400 metres long off True Beach running into shore of shark con stomach contents. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually a great white shark researcher in South Africa, and that oh, slick wow. looked exactly like and smelled exactly like the chum that we used to attract great whites. Oh, really? The fisheries came and took the shark away. The slick is still there running into the beach. Mm. So the shark now turns up, he's going to follow that slick. Mm. We actually told a couple of the surf lifesavers on the beach later and they were shocked. So do you realise what was just happening out there? No, I had no idea. Mm. Uh, things like this are, are fantastic. I think I've yeah. seen a video on that. Yeah, you probably yeah. did actually. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's just. The more of these things to get out there, the better because then it alleviates, as you say, the need to cull sharks, mm. which doesn't keep you safe for anyone. No. Oh. And this kind exactly. of system can. Yeah. So you're researching South Africa? Yeah. Wow. Nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's right. Well, I know they do the shark spotting uh, program at Fisher Bay then. Yeah. They've got the big towers. But someone's actually attacked whilst they were doing that program as well, in, the, in chest tight water. Yeah, that person yeah. ignored two warnings. Oh, okay. Two warnings that there were two great whites at the back of the break and chose to go back in anyway. Yeah, right. And the poor guy from the shark spotting tower had to watch the person get attacked. Mm. So that was a Darwin. Well, they didn't say that in the documentary. Yeah. yeah. They actually haven't had an attack on shark spotters beach since it's been introduced, um, where someone wasn't at least warned. Yeah, right. They had two attacks and both people ignored the warning, sadly, and went back in. And so it's pretty amazing. They had 38 sightings of great white sharks in 17 days in February. Mm. No panic. No call for a cull, no hysteria, no sharks killed, no people attacked. Yeah. You know, it, it's a really effective system in the right spot. You know, you've got to have good spotting to do it. But again, if you combine it with something like the drone, then you can, it's, that just sounds like a fantastic idea to me. Yeah, I mean, even to test it, you could just buy a whole heap of hobby lines and then just rotate them out for a whole day. Absolutely. When they, when they run out, just chuck another one out. Simple. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. What's your name? Ah, uh, Blair. 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 Thanks, Blair. No worries. Cheers. Thanks for the presentation. That's good. Thank you. Good. Did you hear about the presentation? Uh, I actually saw it on Facebook earlier this morning. I think it, I know a lot of people would have heard it earlier. Probably a lot of people would have turned up. We did put it on the um, No Shark Cull page for that. Really? Yeah, I'm surprised by that. There's a little controversy between Sean and um, Natalie. So she doesn't actually want to take the remove it. Actually, I'm sorry to hear that. He was the one who had the issue. I'm not there, sorry. Was it Simon? Simon Blair? Simon Blair. Well, the thing is, the, the initial comment that turned this whole thing south is that I said, you know, protesting the government to stop the shark cut is probably about as effective as protesting the sharks to stop attacking us. So obviously, Natalie thinks that. The government is very receptive to people. I don't. <laughs> That's the difference. I think that you need solutions, not protests.
I'll, I'll be happy to post on that page tonight anyway that yeah. yes, it was an excellent presentation. Yeah. Cool. Cool. We got the YouTube, we got the video. So that's the main thing. I think everyone on that page honestly would, would watch it for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. There might be a few people who get fees and bonds about stupid things, and that's human nature, sadly. But the majority of people on there, I know a lot of people from the East Coast as well, where they're also now starting to look at alternatives to shark nets and drum lines. So, yeah, there's a real chance for exposure to things like this. Yeah, absolutely. Nationally, not just even here in WA, because yeah. there's a lot of pressure that's going to go on New South Wales and Queensland um, over the next season anyway, relating to their programs as well. And this is a public service. Yeah. It's something that Yeah, not trying to commercialise it. It's just a, it's just something that we could do, and I'm sure everybody would love it. People love drones. Kids love sharks. <laughs> it's obvious. People like going in the water. Yeah. You know, like. Watch the Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He took out the money that they waste culling oh, yeah. and the money they waste with helicopters. Yeah. My God, you could do so much more with things like this and yeah. have money left over. Money left over. Combinations of different things. As Absolutely. Well. Yeah. 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 The shark area is great where it is. Yeah. 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 Shark area. Yeah. 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 And the thing is, you can start with just one drone, right? So it's scalable. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Little proof of concept. Yeah, that's the point. Definitely. Might even be worth looking into whether it's one of the surf clubs who's really interested mm -hmm. and seeing if you can do a trial. Yeah. You know, you just get one drone, trial it in maybe November, December when we know the great whites are you know, starting to come around. And just do that one trial and if you start to get an you know, effective result of that. Now that's how you can then build it up and sell the results. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Just go, just go down the hobby store, buy a few things. I'll build with the computer. It's all good. Let's get it done. <laughs> I like it. I mean, all this, I mean, you can actually buy now the drones that have the live feed coming in to your, to your iPhone. So it's, it's like just cheap consumer level stuff. I mean, if you actually have properly funded, like military level, industrial level stuff, it'd be. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Cheers, Matt. Yeah. Thank you.